So I asked you to submit questions related to the exam to that online form. Well, I got three responses. That's better than none. One of them says, please go over matrices, example, lecture one, and more math lab examples. Uh, please go over matrices, example, lecture one, and more math lab examples. Also, can we do over the old tests in class? So this one is actually requesting about three hours of work, <laughs> which we won't be able to do here. But let's, yeah, let's do what we can. And then there was two more questions, but let's actually do something about the matrices. So I'm going to take a popular vote here. What about the matrices? Matrix multiplication, or what is the most burning issue? Remember matrices in lecture one? Uh, uh, huh? If you're asking us to multiply them, but you need to transpose one that doesn't say to transpose, can you say that you can do it? So you actually say, well, this is the, so you basically say, this one has this and this size, this one has this and this size, I cannot do it. Okay. So then you say, I need to transpose one to be able to do that. Okay. okay. So, would so you, you elaborate just that. Okay, would you work it after, or transpose it work? I would work it if I had the time. Okay, you don't. <laughs> but you don't have to. So is, is it fair if I do one example of matrix multiplication to review? Let's do that. So I'm going to open sketchbook. Somebody give me a matrix. One, two, three, four, five, six. Oh boy. One, two, three. I'm just going to say minus three, minus two, minus one just to change it up. <laughs> okay. Okay, that's my first matrix. Okay. So this matrix is two rows by three columns, right? In terms of size. So remember, number of rows. Good point. Uh, I think, no, yeah, I did. I did. I'm recording. So this is two columns. And this is three rows. Oh, oh, oh. Hi, hi, hi. Hello. I love when I write down precisely reverse of what I'm saying. So in order to be able to multiply this matrix by another, this other, how many rows does it have to have? Three. Three. So basically that's what we call that inner dimensions have to match. So let's actually now come up with three by two matrix. Um, who can give me three by two matrix? Can, yes, you. Some numbers. I'm going to put in zeros so I can <laughs> do this easily. How's that? Minus 2 and 0. How's that? <laughs> I'm going to modify your request. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 is easy. If you start multiplying something that has numbers up to 9, uh, good luck. All right. So how do I actually do this? So the result, so this is a 3 by 2. Okay. So the result is going to be what dimension? 2 by 2. So basically this by this. So when I look at the first, first location here, location 1, 1, is a scalar product of the first row and the first column. Okay? So let's call this C. So if this is C, this is A, this is B. Okay? C11 one, one is the first row of A dot product first column of B. If I want to formalize that, okay, in terms of sums, recall that this is a sum, okay, A1, what am I going to go, K, B, K1, okay, so K1 refers to any K element, those that have one here are in the first column, right? And K 
is from 1 to 3. Right? So that is basically 1 times 1 plus 2 times 0 plus 3 minus times minus 2. So that's 1 minus 6, which is minus 5. So then this location here is what location? 1, 2. So first row, second column. Therefore, it's going to be a scalar product of the first row of A and second column of B. So it's going to be 1 times 2 plus 2 times 1. That's 4 plus 3 times 0 is 4. This element here is which element? This element here is which element? C? Yeah, you, you. C? Two, one. Yes? So this element here is in the second row, first column. So that is C21, correct? So C21 is which row of A and which column of B am I going to use? So row two and column one, right? So this is going to be minus three times one plus 0, plus 2. Minus 3 plus 2 is minus 1. Yes. And my next blue is indeed in the row below. So final element is which element? This one here. Second row, second column. So it's C22, right? So this here is C22. And basically I'm going to do minus 3 times 2 minus 2 times 1 plus 0, so that is minus 8. So this is matrix multiplication. Okay. Quick review. Now what is, let's see, how many, every matrix can be shown as either two row vectors or two column vectors, right, in this particular case. Right? So my next blue shirt, good news is I have plenty of blue shirts today. So what would be, okay, <coughs> norm one, norm one of my first column. So my vector, let's call it vector V, is minus five minus one. What is norm 1 of B? Norms are always positive. So remember, norms are always positive. So it's basically absolute value of V1 plus V2. Okay, so it's sum of absolute values. Okay, and that is then 6. So norm cannot be negative. Okay, it's a measure. And it's sort of like something that is trying to do what absolute value of a number is for number. That's what norm is trying to do for vectors. Okay? So it's such a measure, it's always positive. Okay. And then what is my next <coughs> blue? So can you give me any other norm of this vector? L2, what would be the L2 norm? Square root of minus 5 square plus minus 1 square, right? 
So I'm going to take squares. And actually, if I wanted to generalize that, okay, those are so-called LP norms. So that if I had three here, I would take the third root of some cube. Okay? Cubes of absolute values, as a matter of fact. So this is actually square root of 26. All right. So this is a quick review of matrices. Let's go to some other questions. Hmm? I'm just reviewing random topics because I can't review entire lecture, right? So I'm picking up. So unless this question is specific, then I get to pick what to review. So if I had L, so-called L3 norm, or any generalization, so for any P, norm P here, if I only had two elements, would be P, okay? V1 absolute to the P plus absolute V2 to the P. And of course, if I had more elements, I would keep going, okay? If this would be a larger vector, I would keep going. So this is general LP norm. We are mostly looking at 1 and 2. And L infinity is the maximum of the absolute values. So in this case, it would be 5. Possible values, right? I of elements. Yeah. Infinity, yes. Believe it or not. It's hard to tell. Okay? <laughs> it's still hard to tell. Oh well, it's my handwriting. All right? Okay, so this is a quick review of the matrix. Second question, I actually responded to it in email already, uh, but I can do it here for class as well. When doing f printf command, how do we know what letter to use with that percent size stuff? So normally, we use f printf So s is for strings. So that's for text. That's for something that is interpreted as text. So then I can give it a text. So for instance, Masha. Okay. And this is what it's going to get ex executed. Now this is kind of, I don't like when it's printed that way. So I'm going to put slash n just to put it in the next row. <coughs> slash n jumps to the next row so that it's, things are a little easier to read. Now for numbers, I'm going to use, I'm going to give an example as follows. So let's say that x is 4. So I define myself a number 4, and let's print it in different ways. If I have, if I say f print f, x equals 2, and I put d, then I'm telling MATLAB to format this as an integer, which in this case, number is an integer, so that works fine. Okay, so then it's just going to print 4. And I'm going to put jump into the next line just so that things are nicer. Now I can also tell it to print it as a real number or floating point. And for that I put F. And if I put F without anything, then it has certain way to present it. It basically puts the number and then 6 more this uh, digits behind the decimal point, I can control that. So I can say 1.2, meaning put just two digits after decimal point. Yes, and it's still going to print that form. So that, that number there is just for, I don't know, it doesn't really. What is the percent D? Hmm? What is the percent D? Percent D is integer. So 4 is an integer. This is 4 as a real number. Now here I don't have anything to show be, you know, behind the decimal point, so it's not going to do much. Yes? Why did you put backslash n? Just for 
for beauty. It doesn't matter. Again, I wanted to jump into the next line so it's not all <coughs> sitting on top of each other when I, when I do it. Yes? Uh, what's, the, what's the use of this? <coughs> Having nice print up. By now, you, there's actually plenty of things in MATLAB that will print things nicely. But you don't want to basically, if you're putting data in the file, you do actually want to format data precisely in certain rows so the things are lining up. Just like Excel does it for you, but Excel has boxes for that. If you're printing a text file, it's not going to be there. So you have to print it in a formatted way in order to have a nicely aligned piece of data. So if you remember that bell lock that I shared in the first homework, was it? It had a preset. <laughs> that one, yeah. <laughs> so it had those columns where actually there were many columns. Okay? But they were separated clearly the way they were printed out, precisely using, it was a text file, a very plain text file without any other additional format in there. And it was printed, printed in a very organized way so that you can go in and read it. So you use this for large amounts of data? But quite frankly, even if you give me four by four matrix, I would still like it printed nicely so I can read it properly. So large is relative. Can you show us how you format a matrix and not just a There we go. So there was another question here. I'm going to pile things up now here clearly. So there is different types of loops and describe which loop would be the best to use depending on what you want. So let me give you one example of that right here. Let's say that I have a matrix and I'm going to open a script. Open a new script and I'm going to say A is 1, 2.4, 5.1, and 3, 4.5, minus or uh, 1.1. Okay? My A. So I'm going to say, okay, M, N is size of A. What does this do? What does that do? So M is number of rows, N is number of columns. And let's say that I want to actually print that into a file with like a very nicely formatted output. Okay? I actually want to, you know, put 1.0, 2.4, 5.1, 3.0, 4.5, and 1.5, so it's all aligned. Okay? How do I open a file for writing? What's my next blue shirt? One of you is next, I think. F, F I D. So I'm gonna say O A dot. That's gonna be my name of my file, and I'm opening it for writing. I want to write A into the file. And then I'm going to say, I want to print all of the elements. I know I have a two by two table, and a nested for loop is ideal for accessing all of the numbers in this table, because I know precisely how to go. I go first row by row, and for each element in the row. Right? So for loop you use, then you know precisely what is the extent of the repetition you're making, and you just need to do it in an orderly way. So for loop, so what I want here is I want to print every element, and to access every element, I will first start by rows. I want to print it row by row first. For i is equal to 1 through m. m is number of rows. I could have also simply put 1 through 2. Right? Because to, but I want to be a little more general. And then for all of the columns, J is equal to 1 through N. And now I can do something with every element A of IJ. Okay? And I'm going to close these loops first. So this is just the shell of my loop. So for every I this inner for loop will execute once, okay? 
and that's what I want. So now I'm going to say, aha, uh -huh, print things into the file, f print f. Okay. And I'm going to say format 1.1f so that they're all nicely aligned. And space, yes. Yes, I want one digit for before the dot and one after, because that's how my numbers look like there. What's the difference between that and percent? <coughs> A percent? Excuse me. I put it in the wrong. Oh. Yes. Otherwise, here it would actually print 1.1 1 .1 oh. first. So every number would be <laughs> preceded by 1.1. 1 .1. Okay. A of IJ. Just a moment. So this prints this number. I also want to jump to the next line after every row. And second thing, I did not print this to this file, did I? Okay. So I'm just going to say, aha, uh -huh, print next line. numbers are not on top of each other. Otherwise, it will leave no space. I didn't tell it. So format it out, but it's really detailed. So, I w and I'm going to say this f print f example. Okay. And then one thing that I have to do after I'm done is close the file. Let's execute. Just gonna say run. Okay. So when I do run, what shows up here? There should be an a dot take stay. Is there? There's one in my workspace. <laughs> I'm gonna say type. There you go. It's there. So when I type it, I can see there's a space in between, and I jump to the next line, so everything is nicely aligned. So sometimes, if your only way to format output is text files, this is what you have to do. I'm not saying many times you will maybe Excel sheets will be fine. But sometimes in Excel sheets, if you actually want to process them with some software that is maybe a slightly different software and you, or you're not working in Excel, you have to actually export in the text because text is readable by everybody. Okay. Text, you can even send it in an email technically. Okay. Uh, for Excel, you have to have Excel. So you have to know that the other person, that the recipient is having your software. Yes? If I want to give somebody the data, if I want to email it, I have to create the file and output the data into file. Okay. Yes? When did you uh, save that a.cf.txt? Because I just had it as an example of f print f, f print f does that. And I just wanted to save a file to review files as well. No, because you, you, you opened it, you made an a.txt, right? So did you create it? Yes. F open opens a file with certain names on your desk for certain tasks for writing in this case. Okay. So what did you do W versus R? R is for reading. You can actually specify W and R both at the same time, which means that you will be both writing into and reading the file. How would you do that? You would just keep doing it sequentially. So now I could read what it's what's in there. The problem with that is that once you're moving through the file, that's the, it's a dynamic spot. So right now when I, when I write two lines, I'm at the end of the, those two lines. So if I'm trying to read something from that file, good luck, there's nothing to read. Okay? Because you're at the end of the file. Okay? So that's not typically done at the same time. Um, is type a command in that Type is a command, yes. Uh, they just 
right? So. Or I could have tried to open that file here. So yeah, it just types the text file. All right. All right. So this is one, basically, type of the loop, for loops. The question asked me for the best ways when to use which loop. And for the while loop, I will actually go to the example, root finding example we had last time. Do we remember what was the task last time? Let me open the... Root finding. So we started root finding last time. Okay. And strategy in bisection method is to find for a function that you're looking for, and we had this function of the parachutist. This was my function when I plotted it over a certain range. I need to find the so-called bracket. I need to have a lower and upper x value that have opposite sign of the function when evaluated at those points. So here you can see, for instance, for 12, f of 12 is positive, and for 16, f, or here, f of 16 is negative. Okay. So we use that rule when, when, when programming it with it, is that f of xl times f of xu is less than zero. Okay. It's a negative number. So that is a good bracket. And then when I have a bracket, what I do is I basically keep making this interval smaller and try to pick which half of it, by dividing it in half, which half of it is my next bracket. Okay? So I start with 12, 16, halfway in between is 14. I can actually see that f of 14 times f of 16 is negative. So this is my next bracket. So I replace my old xl with 14 now. Okay? Then I keep going, and then I look at 15, and I can see actually that 14 and 15 is my new bracket. So my 16 gets replaced by 15, and I keep going. So I asked you to actually program this. So this is essentially how the program looks like. Okay. So I start with Excel and XU, 12 and 16. I'm first going to explain what I'm doing, then I'm going to say how am I going to put it in the loop. So basically, I find the midpoint, okay? And then I evaluate f, f at x, u, x, l, and this midpoint, okay? And then I'm testing. Is f of x, l times f? of xr less than 0, okay? then xu is equal to xr. So basically, my new upper bracket, my new upper point becomes this xr. Otherwise, if f of xu times f of xr less than 0, then the xl is xr. So now the only thing is like I have to, this will repeat, and I keep apparently replacing either xu or xl, okay, with my new value and shrinking this uh, this number. But I actually don't know how many times this is going to execute necessarily, especially if I'm trying to get within certain accuracy. So this is where while loop is the best because I don't know precisely how many times I'm going to. Then you go with while loop, and you use sort of a rule when to stop. And this is something, so both xu and xl are something that is constantly changing as I'm in the loop. So every loop is actually going to change them. And when you have a situation like that, where you have a dynamically changing situation, while loop is the best. So I'm going to say, OK, the width of this interval, or how close I am to my root, is xu minus xl, keep going until you fall under 0 0.001. Okay. When do I actually stop is up to me, so I could have gone till 0 0.0001 or something of that sort, so that's 
typically something that we decide upon. So let's execute this. And so at the end of this loop, I'm just going to say, OK, print XR. I could also print XU, XL. Which one of these is my root or the closest to root? I don't know which one of them. I know that they're all within 0.001 of my root. So take your pick. <coughs> So basically, my bisection gives me 14.774. We can actually see what XU is versus XL. So you can see that when I take the difference between them, they're at actually at 0 0.01 pretty on the dot. Okay. Point six, so six decimal points after zero. Two point six means two for before zero point six or after zero. Okay, so whenever you say one point two, that's one decimal. <coughs> and it's really what you're directing is those after the zero. It still fits the full number even if you don't leave enough space. Yeah, you say one, it's three hundred. So it's it's still gonna put three hundred. So good point. Let's review functions now that we're here. So this is, I decided to just put this straight away. <laughs> Thank you. So I could have actually programmed this as a function. Okay. So I'm just going to say, uh-huh. going to say new function that computes this and I'm going to say aha uh -huh, fxl is I'm going to call this parachute of excel okay I have what? It's a point one or six eight four three. Oh, okay. It apparently didn't make a huge difference. So I was probably typed it in wrongly yesterday. So I have an extra six. Alrighty. So my option and that will go a long way to make this so-called modular, is just to say fxl is, how am I going to call that function, function parachute for my next blue shirt? My next blue shirt is here busy on her phone. <laughs> so now I'm going to pick on you. So if I have a function parachute that computes something depending on the parameter I get, how am I going to call that function here inside the script? function is named parachute. It's right here. So this is my function. I want to evaluate that function of, and I'm going to give it what I want to compute. That's how I call functions. So I'm just going to say parachute of Excel, and then fxr will be parachute of XR and FXU will be parachute of XU. Yes. Uh, no, that's not a good idea. Function maybe at the end of the file, especially if this is a function file. So don't. Don't define functions necessarily in line. There is an inline way to define a function. Okay. But this is actually more modular. Okay. Because I can now use this. Okay, so I'm going to save. And now if I actually asked you, if 
if I ask you, so here's why it's not necessarily the best idea. Okay? Um, you can define short functions in one line, but I think it's better to put a separate file. Because now if I go and say, uh-huh, let's actually do it for a different function. So there was here at the end of this slide was actually a suggestion of a different function. Okay. Then all I would change is like I would create myself a new file defining this function and just plug that in. So that makes it a little uh, more flexible and easier to change to a new function. There's so many new problems. The only thing that I would have to do, so basically two things, I would have to define a new function with this, and also I would have to scope what is a good bracket for this function. And so I would have to plot the function to see, or kind of poke around a little to find the values such that f of x u times f of x l is less than zero. Okay, and that I typically need to plot the function. Is that clear? So everybody clear how would I convert this for a different problem? Okay. All right. So we will, yes? One quick question. So on the function that you created, uh, the it'll, yeah, it'll, yeah, it'll change with XR and FX, FXU as you define the location as well? Yeah. So it doesn't matter. Basically, I define my function using Excel, right? So this is just the name of the param parameter within this function. Okay? What this Wow, hi. These are two powerful things with the mouse that you don't even know what you do. Okay, so basically all, it, all it's important within this file, it knows what Excel is and it knows how to compute something based on that param parameter. I can call it Excel, I can call it Masha, I can call it Y, I can call it whatever it is that you want to call it. Yeah, so when you say FXR, you're just changing the, you're changing the input variable. I'm giving it a different input. And that's the whole point of having a function, this flexibility to execute for whatever. And it's also less writing. And whenever it's less writing, it's less chance for mistake. So that's what's called modular code, and that's what's actually important. That's why I have functions, because then the code is much easier to read, and you will make less mistakes if you don't repeat the same darn line three times. Okay, this one. This was a quick way to do it. I, do it with cut. I did it with cut and paste and quick change, sure. But this is a much more messy code than this. Clear? Other questions? This is essentially at the same time review of our root finding method and what your elements of things you need to know for your exam, essentially, just because we are doing root finding, technically, I could give you an algorithm and just say, well, program this, without, even if it's root finding or something else that is coming down, uh, down the road. So you actually do know all of the tools that make you uh, build the program. <laughs> so let's look at some other methods in the remaining five to ten minutes. Okay. So, bisection method works most of the time, but you have to find that bracket. But it's also, we will not do much of timing in these methods, but it can be rather slow, kind of crude. So, it's, it's kind of search, a quick search. So, one way to speed it up, or attempt to, depending on of which function you use, and you will see by the end of this lecture that root finding doesn't really guarantee to find anything quickly. Okay? It really depends on the function that you use, how quickly or efficiently will the algorithms work. And this is why we're actually going to go through about five different methods so that there's enough methods that you disposable that you can speed up your calculations as necessary. Okay? So often you kind of have to optimize things based on the calculations. So for instance, in thermodynamics, there is a specific calculation that you're going to do. You're going to kind of test things once, figure out what's the fastest, 
and basically project that most likely for all the time, if you have to repeat this 10,000 times, you're going to be using that method that meant 10,000 times, so speeding it up makes sense, right? To kind of work on case-by-case -case basis. So, basically what the, the problem with dissection is that it doesn't really consider your function at all. It just goes and bisects the interval and figures out which side is better and keeps going. So I keep halving the interval. If I start from a very large interval, then of course uh, you can see how that could be problematic. So there's so-called false position method that can try to be a little smarter. So if this is my function on xl, xu, okay? So f of xl here is negative, f of xu here is positive, so basically that is a good bracket. If I did bisection, <coughs> all bisection would do is just halve this in two and basically uh, work for you. <coughs> but I can actually take a look at function and basically its root is right here. So this method bets that if I approximate, I take a first order approximation to this function which is basically a line between these two points. Okay? Slope of that line is f of xu minus f of xl divided by xu minus xl. So I can basically find where this line intersects y is equal to 0. Okay? And I can say, well, maybe that's a better choice for my next point instead of the midpoint. So this is going to be my xr. And at every iteration, that's what I actually do as my next point to okay. Fine. So it's just, but we'll see how well it does and whether it does well. So basically, we're going to suggest, let's see how to compute for that xr. So these two shaded triangles are so-called similar, okay, because they have the same corners here and angles. This is a right angle, right angle, this angle and this are the same, this angle and that angle are the same. So basically my f of xl, this length, divided by this length, which is xr minus xl, is the same as f of xu divided by this length. And this is actually xu minus xr. Now, the only thing why this is negative is that this one was negative, so I had to take a minus on it. So when I actually find xr from it, you can rearrange things and find that your xr is xu minus f of xu times xl minus xu. So that's just basically solving the equation that I just showed on the previous slide for xr. So basically now I can say, uh-huh, well, I can design a method and you're hoping that it's going to be quicker, though that's not necessarily guaranteed. So basically you just, at every point, you say, well, this is my mix xr and I keep going. Okay. So, in theory, not always, if you actually look at the error that you're making and how close, so you want error to get smaller and smaller as you keep going. This is when false position works well, it's dropping down much faster than bisection is. So let's try it out. Okay. Take your bisection of m and simply modify it to actually do this problem. So start from the same thing. And we can work with the parachute problem. And also, compute relative error in both cases, so we will actually compare both of these. So most of the code you kind of already have. Yes? Just 
So modify your code. Really, you would take one line modification with the readings and stuff. <laughs> you already in that code have computed f of x u. You already computed f of x l. You have Excel, you have X, you just have to say what XR is. Oh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's not complicated. And you don't have to, yeah, that's all. And then you just pick which one's better. X upper limit is the left bound. Yeah. X lower, X upper. So this is your new, your XR is not a midpoint. This is, there's that one line that computes XR, replace it with this, and you're good to go. <laughs> Beauty of cut copy pasting and reusing the code. <laughs> so essentially, just replace this portion where you're computing XR with this. And the rest of the code is the same. And we name it as full position. I'm not going to ask for turning it because of the So the logic of it is still there, and those are the elements you need to know. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
For the while loop, I put instead of the x1 minus x2 is very then uh, you can put whatever you want. I did that. That's just because it's not equal to zero. Yeah. 